Oh, I've had, by the grace of God, opportunities to meet heads of states, practically all over the world. And now I'm telling you, it is easier to see Jesus than to see some heads of state. Because even after you have shown evidence that I am coming at the invitation of the head of state, they will pass through through so many security doors. But today, you can go on your knees in the next one minute and you gain direct access to the Most High God because of the blood that was shed at Calvary. But not only that, if you read Exodus chapter 12 verse 13, Exodus 12 verse 13, the Bible recalls for us that when the angels of death, and I'm sure I've told you before, that some times ago I read an article one of my regrets is that I didn't keep that article. Where it was recorded that all the sicknesses and diseases in the world could be put into 39 categories. All manners of fevers. Malaria fever. Uh, every, any other kind of fever. Yellow fever, etc. We put them in one category all manners of cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, blood cancer, put it in one category. 39 categories for all sicknesses and diseases in the world. And yet, Jesus Christ took 40 stripes, a stripe for each known disease, and an extra stripe waiting for those here to be discovered. I'm sure you must be wondering why as deadly as coronavirus is, so many people are still surviving. Because someone long time ago took a stripe to wait for sicknesses and yet uh, disease yet to be discovered. Oh, today, every child of God, whatever sickness or disease may want to knock at your door, you can face it with the stripes of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is with boldness that I am saying to every one of you in any form of sickness or disease or pain, by his stripes, receive your healing in Jesus' name. Amen. I shared with you what happened when I went to Zambia for the first time. And I ate what they gave me and it didn't agree with my stomach. And I kept going to the toilet, I think, it's around the 23rd or 24th time that it just occurred to me that, ah, God said, you shall lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. He didn't say who the sick will be. I'm the one in trouble now. So I laid my own hands on my own bed. And I commanded, stomach, be still. And instantly, the problem was over. So you, you do it. Start with yourself. Go ahead. Try it with your children. Try it with your friends. That's how I started. When I started laying hands on the sick, I started with my children, with friends that I know will not tell if I fail. Today now, because I've tested it and I've found it to be true, I can lay hands on anyone, anywhere. Because mighty power came to, through that name after Calvary. I told you, some of you are old enough, you remember. 
I lost my fear of death years ago when my mother called me and said, hey, the way you are going, you are not likely to be in when I die. <laughs> so I want you to do something for me. I want to see the coffin you are going to use to bury me. I want to see the dress I will wear. She described to me, you must make the wedding like the wedding of somebody who is about to be married. So we built a very nice coffin. We got one of my daughters to measure her and they built her a wedding dress. She put the wedding dress on and said, ah, this good, this fits very perfectly. The, the coffin, <laughs> the coffin we made is a kind you can open by the side. So we opened the side, she lay down in the coffin and said, ah, uh -huh. I'm ready anytime. Oh Lord God Almighty. From that day onward, I lost my fear of death. A true child of God knows that when she leaves this world, she's going into a wedding. You're going to be married to the great bridegroom. It's nothing to fear. You can't die until your day comes. And when your day comes, nothing can stop you. So there's nothing to fear in death because your husband, your bridegroom, has the keys of death. I'm sure you had the testimony of a young boy when we started uh, nursery school at a good meta way back at in 1981 or 82. And we used uh, one of these care care bus, that's what we called they called them in those days, to go and bring children from their homes. So they were bringing these children to school. And uh, because the bus wasn't big enough to take all of them, this boy was sitting on the uh, dashboard of the boss facing the driver and there was arm robbery in the Butemeta in Oigo and a stray bullet pierced through the front of the boss went into the back of this boy came out in his stomach bringing out his intestines The teacher who went to collect them held the intestine with her hand as they drove to loose from Oyibo with all the traffic jams on the way. By the time they got to loose and they looked at the boy, they saw <laughs> he had lost a lot of blood. They saw the perforated intestine. They the doctors thought, there's no need wasting time on this one. This one is gone. One hour after the boy arrived in the hospital, when they saw that he was still breathing, well, at least let's patch him up. He's still alive today. You cannot die until your day comes because the bridegroom has the keys of death. I've told you the story of a lady who the doctors told her husband at Luth that there is no hope for her, that she would definitely be gone by the following morning. And the husband left Apparently, the husband wasn't really the kind of husband who you think a husband should be. Left her, I said, well, bye-bye, my dear, see you. Came out of the hospital, called his girlfriend and said, well, it looks as if the, the stupid fellow is going to be gone before tomorrow. Why don't you come over? 
And after the doctors left, after the husband left, after the nurses have settled down for the night, someone dressed like a doctor walked in. He didn't open the door. He just walked straight because he himself is the door. Came to her where she, she was lying and touched her and said, My daughter, I am the Lord that he let thee. And immediately she was made whole. When she got up and packed her loads and got to the nurses, they thought they saw a ghost. They called the doctors in and they checked her everywhere and found that she was completely well. By the time she got home, because the husband didn't even bother to lock the bedroom door, she found the husband and the husband nearly fainted because he too saw, thought he was seeing a ghost. Our good news for those of you that are being condemned to die. In the name of the one who is stronger than death, you will be made whole. Amen. Oh, I've, I've told you several stories about people who all of a sudden moved from abject poverty to, ab uh, to absolute surplus. I've told you the, the story of one of my friends whose parents were so poor they couldn't even send him to school. I mean, my parents were poor, but his own parents were poorer than my parents. And so while all of us went to school, at a very tender age, he was doing labor job. And at the back of the house of a man that was asked to hold, suddenly his hope hit something. And by the time he found out what it was, it was a big pot loaded with gold coins because in the olden days there were no banks rich people put their money in pots and buried them at least in our area you know the story i don't have too much time to begin to repeat it in details to you but by the time he sold the gold coins he became so rich that very soon <laughs> he disappeared because the rich befriend the rich. Uh, they don't befriend the poor. I decree to someone listening to me today that by the time this lockdown is over, your level will change. Yeah. Oh, you may say those, those, those kind of miracles don't happen anymore. Well, I'm sure at least you know. Those of you who are old enough to know. That it is possible for somebody to go to bed a nurse and wake up as a first lady. That God is still on his throne. He will change your fortune. Amen. I'm going to ask you to watch a clip. This clip is taken from one of our conventions. It will show you clearly that I'm not talking theory. I'm talking about something that I know, that I've experienced, that thousands of others have experienced. You're going to see in this clip thousands of people who were barren before, who came to one convention and we prayed. And by the time they came to the second convention, they were around with their children. You will see them by the thousands. You will see homes where there had been sorrow, where by the special grace of God, suddenly there was joy. And I have good news for those of you who are trusting God for the fruit of the womb. Because my daddy has expressly asked me to show this clip to encourage you and to let you know that even during this year's convention, those who will return with their children will be far, far more than those we have ever seen before. Yeah. And that even before this lockdown is over, the barren, many, many of the barren, 
we become fruitful. Yeah. At the beginning of the Holy Ghost service, when we come to the redemption camp for Holy Ghost night in those days, probably the people will be maybe 6,000 people, 7,000. I would lay hands on everybody. And I mean practically everybody we had all night long. Lay hands on the sick, lay hands on the barren, etc., uh, etc. Et but then the crowd grew. And it was becoming difficult for me alone to lay hands on everybody. So I selected seven of the elders, prayed for them specially. Gave each one of them one of my ties that I'd used in ministry. I said, hey, this tie will carry part of my anointing to you. And they began to help me. And things were happening. But then the crowd kept growing. To the state that by the, the grace of God today, we can talk about multitudes. And you know what? God has made the job even easier still. I don't have to lay hands on anybody now. I don't even have to touch a tanker chief before they become anointed. Because the Almighty God showed me through the little science I know yeah, that power can be transferred through conduction, that is by touching, that power could be transferred through convention, to put the power in a medium that will carry the power to where it is needed. And then the power could be transmitted by radiation. That's why today, by the grace of God, and I give God all the glory, I could stand at the altar and wave my hands. And hundreds of thousands of handkerchiefs will become anointed. And testimonies will follow. More than 10 years ago, there was an anniversary of the modern day Holy Ghost outpouring. We call it Azusa Conference in America. And great men came from all over the world. And there were two of us who were invited from Africa. One great man of God from South Africa and my humble self from Nigeria. Thousands upon thousands of people were there. And those of us who were to be speakers, they kept us in a room. They call it Green Room. And there was all manner of food there. And I mean all manners. Food and drinks. I was going to be the last speaker for that day. And people, all these great men, they were having fun, eating, enjoying themselves. I, I hid myself in a corner because I know that this is a defining moment in my life. And I kept on praying in the Holy Spirit. I kept on praying in the Holy Spirit. Finally, the time came. The great man had, before me had spoken wonderfully. And then it was my turn to speak. And the Holy Spirit took over. And when I gave the altar call, even this mighty man came to the altar. Last year, I was in Uganda. And the young man there, well, a fairly young man, <laughs> who was at that meeting, as a matter of fact, he was the one that they sent to invite me came to see me. I said, sir, you minister at Azusa more than 10 years ago. And I've yet, I'm yet to recover from the impact of that ministration. He said, you may not know it because he was one of the, a member of the organizing committee. He said, you may not know it, but your tapes the people were buying your tapes. The 
the number of tapes that they bought from you is more than all the other tapes combined. What is it I said that those great men have never heard before? It wasn't me speaking. It was the Holy Spirit propelling the world, backing it up. If you will apply this simple principle, you will suddenly see doors opening. You will suddenly see yourself moving closer and closer to the fulfillment of your destiny. Now, oh, I've told you the story of a friend of mine who was extremely wealthy. That by the time of his death, in far away Australia, he had more than $250 million. I will tell you how rich he was. But he had no peace. Because when the Lord sent me to him and we were discussing, he told me every time he closed his eyes to sleep, he will find himself among dead people. People with half head, uh, broken bodies, people who had died years before. And so he is always afraid to sleep. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, that is when peace steps in. I can remember years ago when we first moved to this camp, Redemption Camp. Our neighbors were pythons, and there were many of them. I mean, we were killing them at a regular interval. Even I killed one with my walking stick when going for prayer work. This was also the headquarters of highway robbers. And yet, when I decided to leave Moshi to come here, and uh, <laughs> we had a little bit of argument, because my wife felt that uh, leaving Moshi to come to this bush is like leaving fry pan for fire. For the first time in our life, and the only time in our marriage, we became democratic. <laughs> we got the children together. I said, let us vote. All those who are in favor of going to the camp, say yes. And they all said yes. And I joined their yes. And we moved in here. They said yes because they just felt if daddy is going there. Uh, Daddy will take care of us. Let's go. And in any case, we'll have an opportunity to ride bicycles, the kind that we can ride in Moshi. I remember one occasion I was traveling from Britain to Nigeria, and there was a great man of God and his wife uh, in the same plane. And he, according to his testimony, which we had later on, he told his wife, ah, that the Jew is in the plane. <laughs> Nothing to worry about. But then as we were halfway through the journey, we ran into some very serious turbulence. And the plane was jumping up and down, jumping up and down. Then he, he, he said he got up, looked at where I was, and found that I was fast asleep. Oh, he returned and told the wife, there's nothing to worry about, daddy is sleeping. He said his faith, his great peace was multiplied. I pray for all of you, whatever may be the level of your faith or peace, may that peace be multiplied in Jesus' name. Amen. I remember very well one old man, I'm sure you've heard me tell about him, who came here when he was uh, two weeks to the age of 88, I think. And he said that he has come to me for prayers. I said, yes, what about? He said uh, when he was 44 or so, uh, a prophet came to him. And he prophesied everything that will happen to him in detail. How many houses he will build, how he will prosper, etc., etc., everything. 
But he said that at the age, I can't remember very clearly now, whether 88 or 84, he will die. And that there are only two weeks to go before that date will come. He said, that's why he has come. So I could pray for him. Uh, he'll be ready to go. I asked him, are you ready to go? <laughs> he said, well, not really, but uh, the prophet said, and everything he had said came to pass. I smiled. I said, you just gave your life to Jesus Christ just about two years or so ago. I mean, if you see his house in his town, uh, <laughs> if they don't show you the way, if you enter into his house, you will not find your way out. That's how big the house was. After he gave his life to Jesus, he came and built a two-bedroom bungalow in the camp here. And apparently, as soon as he realized that the day was coming close, he moved from his big house somewhere nearby to come and live here. He said, I'm not afraid. What else do I want? I have been healthy. God has prospered me. I know now I'm going to heaven if I die. He said, I just want God to, I want you to pray that my passage will be easy. He had peace all around. Of course, I told him, sir, that prophet must be a great prophet, but by the grace of God, the greater prophet is here. Amen. And as far as I'm concerned, you are not going anywhere yet. Now that you are born again and you want to serve God, you are not going anywhere yet. That man, when he was about just a few days or so before he turned a hundred, he sent for me and said, Please let me go. <laughs> let me go. I said, no problem. I've told some of you the story before. We, we were going to Heathrow in uh, our blessed uh, Nigeria Airways of Blessed Memory. Uh, <laughs> and we got to Heathrow and they asked us to fasten our seatbelts. We did. And then suddenly the captain came and said, well, ladies and gentlemen, we have a little problem. What's the problem? He said, the landing gear of the plane has refused to come out. Oh, that's a little problem. And I, I, I was in traveling first class in those days because somebody, <laughs> somebody bought the ticket. And there were all, all the great men I am mighty there, there. That day I saw that worthy people don't want to die. There was commotion all over the place. There was a woman sitting behind me and was, oh God, I'm going to London to take care of my grandchild. Nobody asked her. And there was a man there who had a walking stick made of gold and the handle was encrusted with diamonds and he has been going to the toilet regularly just to show us the walking stick now when they, we heard what the uh, pilot said this time he really wanted to go to the toilet <laughs> he, he got up and the hostess said sit down please he said who said so <laughs> And I'll tell you the truth, I was troubled. Ah, Lord, when I was saying goodbye to my children last night, you didn't tell me this would be my last flight. And then I heard him say, no, don't worry yourself. I want to talk with you. And I need to talk to you before you land. As soon as you get down, they won't let you listen to me. Oh. I just sat down snugly by the by the window where I was sitting listening to my father and I was pandemonium all around me I was as cool as cucumber the, the pandemonium became intensified 
when the pilot came back and said, ah, ladies and gentlemen, calm down. After all, you know that the firefighters in Nitro are very efficient. Hey, firefighters, you, <laughs> you mean we're going to catch fire? And for 45 minutes, the play was going around, 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 and I was enjoying my Lord. When we finished talking, suddenly the gear came out. When you have heard from God, you can enjoy the kind of peace that the Bible calls peace, life, a river. We were traveling this time to London in British Airways, and I was traveling economy. And those of you who travel economy, you know very well that the food they give you is not much, which is probably why they give you plenty of coke to shock it. And I was a hungry young man. Just as we took off from Lagos, they've set the table and they brought their little, little food to us. And then the captain said, well, this is your captain. Uh, by the time we get to Heathrow, there's going to be a storm, but don't worry, we'll manage to land. We'll manage to land. <laughs> as soon as he said that, the man sitting next to me froze. He didn't touch his food. For me, I finished my food quickly. Then I looked at him. I said, sir, you are not eating. He was surprised because all the time I was sitting, he was looking at me with one corner, corner eye. He said, you speak English? I said, yes, sir. <laughs> you heard what the pilot said? I said, yes, sir. I said, you are not eating? He said, no, can I? <laughs> so I took his plate, I passed my own to him. I finished the food and I went to sleep. When we got to Heathrow, the pilot came back and said, well, ladies and gentlemen, the weather boys have deceived us. The storm that they said is going to be in London is actually going to be in Scotland. <laughs> I looked at my friend. I laughed. He laughed. We were laughing for different reasons. <laughs> I was laughing because there's nothing he can do to get his food back. <laughs> but how did I have that peace that passes all understanding? He has done it before. He will do it again. So one more time, I'm telling you, my children, relax. Amen. All is going to be well. Amen. What you should do today is praise him with all your heart. Thank him because you belong to him at a time like this you will probably remember the testimony of one of my daughters who said i need help what's the problem he said a strange woman has taken away my husband i've done everything i could do but my husband finally packed out left me with four children and went to go and live with a woman who has five children I said, that's no problem. We will call on the one who is the author of marriage. And your husband will come home begging. Ah, she said, I'm not asking him to come and beg. I will beg him. Just let him come back. I said, well, let's wait and see. So we prayed a simple prayer. I said that the almighty God will cause a problem between her husband and the strange woman. A quarrel nobody will be able to settle. And that's my prayer for all of you who are having problems with your marriage. If anyone is trying to destroy your marriage, my God will take care of the situation. Amen! It wasn't long after that that uh, the two of them quarreled. That's the husband and uh, the strange woman. And the strange woman said to the man, Aren't you, are you sure your head is correct? Because if your head is correct, how can you leave four children at home? 
and come and live with a woman with five children and none of the five is your children. None of them. So he said, no problem. What you are saying is correct. My head must not be correct if I do what I've done. So he packed his bag and he came, knocked at the door of my daughter and the daughter opened the door, saw him and he proceeded and said, please take me back. Ah, you don't need to beg, just call me. Every storm in your marriage will be stilled today in Jesus' name. Amen. You will remember the story of a man who had a quarrel with his wife and the wife who happened to be his, his very special kind of wife told him that by the time I finish with you, you will trek in Lagos. And the husband laughed. How can I possibly trek in Lagos? Because at that time he had 14 cars. But he didn't know who he was dealing with. Little by little, all the cars were gone. Because contracts that he had already executed and had been paid for develop all kinds of problems and the government said you must repay. When he had only one car left and 50 cobble in his pocket, well 50 cobble of them will probably be about 50 naira now. He asked himself, what do I do? If I spend this 50 cobble to eat, and we have no money to buy petrol, then I will trek like my wife prophesied. If I spend the money in buy fuel, what will I eat? That was the day he himself found his way. I mean, found his way to a Butemeta. And he surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. The day he was sharing his testimony, he was dedicating two new houses at the same time. I've told you a funny story before. At least some of you have heard me tell this funny story. Years ago, when I was in Suka in the 1960s, University of Nigeria in Suka, by the grace of God, I'm fairly good in mathematics. And in mathematics, it's either you know what you are asked to solve or you don't know it. And there was this particular subject that I was very good in. And then I go to the examination hall. And well, they gave us eight questions. I read through the entire eight. I could not see one I recognized. What do I do? In the meantime, all my mates were writing furiously. Well, in those days, if you fail, they will allow you to come and receipt that paper you failed. So since I cannot recognize anything, I felt I better go. But as I was about to stand up, one mighty hand kept me sitting down. It's today now I know that it is the Almighty God. So I sat down. After about 15 minutes, sitting down, everybody was writing furiously. I would not have not written anything. Uh, now, let me read this thing again. I read the first one. I, I know this. <laughs> it is this, this, this fellow's formula. I, I read the second one. This is also so equation. I read it all. I read all eight. In the time left, I answered all eight. If you a problem in your academics, bring in Jesus. And I remember I told them this story so many years ago. I told them of the story of four boys who were uh, playing somewhere in Asurok. And as usual, for boys, when boys gather together, they begin to boast about their parents. And the, the, the son of the president said to the remaining three and said, of course, you all know that my father is the greatest. And they all said, why? Said, ah, 
my father is the number one man in the state, in the country, so my father is the greatest. Oh, the second one said, no, my father is greater than your father. He said, ah, how? He said, because my father is your father's physician. If he commands your father to stay in bed for one week, president or no president, he must obey. And the third one said, <laughs> but my father is greater than your two fathers. And the, the other said, how can that be? The boy said, you all know my father is your father's uh, wish doctor. Your father's herbalist. He can kill your fathers. Uh, and nobody will know who did it. And then the fourth boy, who happens to be the son of a messenger in, the, in Nazareth, says, but my father is greater than all your father. <laughs> they all looked at him and they said, ah, you? <laughs> yeah, we know your father. Your father, your father is a messenger. I said, no, you don't know my father. I'm not talking of my father here on earth. I'm talking of my father in heaven. He cannot only kill, he can raise the dead. His name is Jesus. I remember I told them a testimony at that time of one of my daughters who was doing her youth service in Port Harcourt. She was traveling from Lagos to Port Harcourt. At that time, the highway from the west to uh, Be uh, or, uh, and to Bini was just made and it was good. So vehicles could travel at Oh, breakneck speed. And so as he was traveling in this uh, Peugeot station wagon, she was sitting at the, at the back, you know, the, you know the station wagon, sit in front, sit in the middle, sit at the back. She was one of those sitting at the back. When all of a sudden, at high speed, the front tire burst, and the car began to some, some assault. As the car was doing the first somersaulting, she shouted, Jesus. And the window of the car opened. An unseen set of hands picked her up at the back, brought her out of the window, sat her by the highway side, and she watched as if she was watching a horror film as the car continued to somersault. The car somersaulted five times before landing on his back. When people came, because as, as the accident happened, all other vehicles stopped. When they came and they saw the horrors, and they saw a girl sitting by the roadside. They wonder, what are you doing here? She said, I came out of that car. <laughs> Nobody could believe it. He said, you are, you are joking. He said, I, I was reading my Bible when the accident happened. My Bible is still there. This is my name. Go. They went and they saw the Bible. And they saw that it had the same name as the girl sitting by the roadside. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runs into it and he saved. I remember I told them at that time the testimony of uh, one of my sons. I told them uh, after my wife and I got married, the first three children were done by cesarean operations. Because the doctor said that certain bones were bent somewhere and that she cannot deliver uh, naturally. So after three children, we said that's enough, we better stop. Then we became born again. And then one day I was reading Luke chapter 1 verse 37. For with God nothing shall be impossible. The doctors may say impossible. Uh, the laws of nature might say impossible. But with God nothing shall be impossible. And I told my wife, we're going to have another child. 
because but for the problem <laughs> I love children so much that uh, I probably would have had 12 to cut a long story short my wife became pregnant and uh, all, all my friends all my relatives told me please don't kill your wife uh, for, uh, at that time now we were not even going to any hospital anymore I had a, an uncle who was a specialist surgeon, and he spoke to me. I said, "Listen, I know you have accepted this religion, and you, and in those days they would say I accepted a little bit of madness with it." He said, "Let me tell you the truth. Let me tell you the truth how it is." He said, "If the baby is extremely small." and manages to come out one way or the other. He said, your wife had been sutured three places inside. During labor, at least one of the suturing will rupture and your wife will bleed to death. <laughs> I smiled. I said, sir, that's not written in the Bible. What is written is that with God, nothing shall be impossible. Anyway, to cut a long story short, some of you know the story, um, my wife came, I mean, my wife day came for my wife to deliver, she gave birth to my son, and it was uh, the biggest boy we ever had since then. I remember that a week after that one, I had a meeting with uh, some student doctors at Luth. They had a retreat, and and I shared the testimony with them. They, 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 their mouths were open. They couldn't believe what I was selling them. And then one of my friends, who is a scientist, said to me, well, uh, uh, Dr. Deboe, you, you, you're a scientist. You know that uh, nothing is proved scientifically until it can be repeated. Ah, OK. <laughs> so we went ahead and repeated it. And I got another baby, which is bigger than the first one, just to show the, <laughs> to show the world that there is someone called the Almighty. And you know what? His name is Jesus. And that Almighty is on your side. They brought a man to the church at Ebutemeta several years ago. When he came, he had this strange illness. None of the joints can bend. So the hands were stiff as a rock. The legs stiff as a rock. Everything stiff. He couldn't, he couldn't kneel down. He couldn't do if to, to get up at all if he should lie down. It would require people to pick him up again. We prayed a simple prayer. And the Almighty God healed him. He was able to kneel, he was able to lift his hand, he was able to clap. And we all rejoiced. For about two weeks, he kept coming to church. And we were all singing together, rejoicing together. Then after some time, we didn't see him. So we decided to follow him up. When we got there, brother, we, we have not seen you in church for a couple of Sundays. What happened? He said, ah, what do you mean, what happened? When you go to the hospital and you are well, <laughs> don't you come back home? I came to your church. God healed me. I mean, is it your church that healed me? We said, no, sir. God healed me. And that's why I'm back home. But God said we shouldn't forsake the assembly of God. He said, eh, thank you very much. Mm. I came, you played your part, I'm back home. Mm. A couple of months or so later, either months or weeks, because the man was living somewhere in Yaba, and at that time I was working at the University of Lagos. I was driving to the campus. And I saw the same man coming. This time, the hands were back. 
the same way it was when he came. The legs were back. He had to be walking uh, with the legs wide apart. And this time around, even the mouth can close. He decided not to dwell. And so the blessing was taken away from him. In conclusion, the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. 